All right, guys, we're going to get this going. Uh, my name is Christian Medina. Uh, we're here to talk about user interfaces today. Um, why user interfaces? I've been uh, working with computers ever since monochrome monitors and ASCII text was the best you could do to uh, give uh, a good user experience. And I've gone through the evolution. Uh, and for me, user interfaces has always been a pain uh, to put together, especially when you're trying to deliver a really uh, immersive experience for your, for your customers or your users. So what we're going to do today, uh, before I dive into everything, is I, I just had like a, a quick definition so we know what it is that I'm referring to when I say user interface. Um, and really my favorite definition is uh, uh, Wikipedia is it's the space in which human and computer interactions occur. So we're not just talking about graphics, we're not just talking about um, showing something to the user, but also getting uh, inf uh, input from the user, right? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a little bit of uh, uh, the story in Python of the different things and uh, systems at the different levels as user interfaces have, evol have evolved. Uh, we'll go into, I'll mention some of the libraries. I can't get into all the details. Um, this is just stuff I've run into over the years. Um, and hopefully you guys can get something from here that you can go uh, look up uh, for more information later. Uh, so for the very basic things for text-based and command line interfaces, um, this is when you're just uh, trying to either parse information from your, uh, from your users, grab some, uh, grab some input, or when you're trying to show something in a prettier way, let's say, uh, out in a terminal or command line. Uh, these are the libraries that I use the most. Uh, Docopt and Click are great for uh, parsing uh, parameters off of uh, command line input. And then terminal tables is a way of uh, presenting tabular data for you. Uh, and then blessings, if you don't know about blessings, there's a PyCon 2015 uh, video on it. It's very interesting, gives you a bunch of shortcuts into um, doing different neat tricks in the terminal, uh, including j everything from colors to uh, um, things that allow you to do like a whole Python interpreter that does uh, autocomplete while you're in your interpreter in text, right? So as we move forward and get more into graphics, I want to I make the distinction between native operating system graphics and non-native, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, by native, I mean operating systems the way and the libraries that, that present widgets for you. And by widgets, we mean buttons, text boxes, and similar things. Um, these are all calls that you make down at the operating system level that uh, have predetermined way of giving you a user experience so that when you're in Windows, you get Windows buttons, Windows text boxes. When you're in Linux, you get KDE, J GTK, whatever, buttons and text boxes, same thing for OS X. So uh, WX widgets is, one of, is the most famous here. You can, it actually call, does those native calls for you so you can reuse your code across different operating systems and uh, uh, you, and you get a native look and feel. Uh, another another uh, useful one is PyGTK. PyGTK is uh, specifically for GTK uh, libraries. You can run it in, in different OSs as long as you got the GTK stuff going. Um, then there's non-native. Uh, and by that I mean when we, things have evolved to the point where instead of producing, instead of giving you a call into hey, Windows, give me a button, or uh, hey, OS X, give me a button. These guys solve that situation differently. So you get uh, PyQt, for example, and PySize, which is the, uh, the more open licensed version of it. Um, they actually draw the widgets for you. So they go pixel by pixel and say, this is what a PyQt button looks like. This is what a PyQt window looks like. And then they have all the events hooks and, and whatnot in the back end. But when you write a PyQt application, you get the same thing across different OSs. Uh, and same thing for TKinter, which comes default with Python. And then Kiwi. Kiwi solves it in a, a little bit differently uh, using OpenGL. And what that gives you the capability is any OS where you have OpenGL call uh, access, um, you can actually write a piece of code that can run across them. So you can get something that runs on your desktop, on iOS, or on Android. Um, it has its limitations and it's not as easy as, it, as I mentioned, but it's, uh, 
useful for cross-platform. Um, so this we all know of. I just want to do a, a quick thing here, which is um, the web uh, started off where we have basically static pages, static uh, commands out to a browser, and things have evolved considerably since when, where we started, where we have now HTML5 and JavaScript. And for most of you that do front-end work, I imagine you do it uh, using these languages or some sort of mix of that in Python. Um, that's where I was stuck in for several years. Um, and the big thing here is that, and I'll get into that a little bit more later, uh, we've come to the point where we can deliver cross-platform, cross-browser uh, user interfaces in a simpler way using uh, browsers. Um, so we'll get into mobile for a little bit. I have like a little section here. It's just, uh, an, I consider it another implementation of the native OS type systems. But again, Kiwi works in mobile and there's always Toga where we have our friend Russell Keith McGee here who's uh, Toga deserves their own little uh, section for the Beware project. Um, Russell is a very brave man. Uh, to go off and do all of the uh, all of the work behind allowing us to write Python code in, that that can run in iOS, Android, uh, and even the web. And he's had some interesting ways of solving the problems. Everything from calling Objective C directly to Java bytecode and J uh, JavaScript transpilers. Um, so you guys should take a look at that. He's always looking for contributors. Um, another group of uh, category of interfaces is gaming. We have uh, Pygame is the most famous of this. You can do PyOpenGL if you want to do direct OpenGL calls, which, well, it's at your own risk. Um, OpenGL, what can I say? Uh, so, uh, uh, but the, the important thing with gaming is that we're talking, uh, gaming interfaces are less standardized. We're not saying the inputs are the most standard stuff. People, you know, AWSD kind of move your character back and forth in a first-person shooter, maybe. Um, but everybody has their own dashboards. Everybody has their own way of representing information, their own HUDs, depending on the game. Uh, uh, I do want to have a section for chatbots, because that's a thing now. For me, chatbots is just a specialized implementation of command line interfaces where you parse information from a more natural language type system. Um, Chatterbot is a Python module specifically for making chatbots. Um, NLTK, if you haven't looked at that, the natural language toolkit is great to get uh, parsing just normal conversation, books, things like that. And they have a very good online PDF, HTML like uh, manual that'll give you an idea of all the intricacies that go b behind this. Spacey is similar to NLTK. Um, and then the big question is, what does Python do when you want to get into virtual and augmented reality? And this is one of the things that I kind of uh, been wanting to uh, get into and see what we can do. So I like fiddling. Um, and so when I started doing these things, one of my main goals was pretty much experimenting and trying to learn more Python language features. Specifically, I wanted to get into a bit more of async I.O. I wanted to research all the tech that we had out there to see if we can put something together where we can use Python uh, to uh, reduce boilerplate code because I've spent a lot, of, a lot of time writing JavaScript and I want to reduce that as much as possible. Um, and of course I want to take advantage of object inheritance and the whole point of that being if I make um, image widget and then I want to make a gallery. I just want to be able to reuse my image widget, make my gallery, uh, make it pip installable and distribute it, right? Um, and stop reinventing the wheel, obviously. So the technology does exist today. We can still, can still use some work, but so everything, I started from the idea of let's try, work, try and see how far we can get with just browsers. Um, the, like I was saying earlier, JavaScript got a huge efficiency bump many years ago uh, from Google and Mozilla projects and they, CSS and HTML5 came along and they've given you access to uh, considerable improvements 
as, as far as video and even in mobile you can access your different inputs that you have in mobile like swipes, multi-touch, cameras, accelerometers and things like that. So we're going to base things on browsers and then we're going to look at what um, widget libraries are out there. The, this is a thing, now you can actually say hey I want to bootstrap uh, which is a CSS and JavaScript library that gets distributed for, for web pages. I'm sure some of you have used it. This is the most common one. Or material design that's kind of like the Android design. Um, so I can, I can get the same look and feel. People, people are used to working with web now versus some years ago where if you made an application that didn't quite go with the operating system you were running on, people were like, oh man, what is this? This, this is not a Windows app, or especially in, in the initial Java days. Um, so we have the widget libraries to help us do things, and they even take care of like all the quirks to go for growing cross-browser. Then came WebSockets with HTML5. Autobahn is a group of libraries there's a Python version, there's Java, uh, I want to say that there's a C version as well. Um, and Autobahn runs Python 2, Python 3, you get a WebSocket server, WebSocket clients. Um, for 2, it uses uh, Twisted for all, its, all of its I.O. And for 3, it does everything based on async I.O. Since I was interested in async I.O., I took this up to see how far I can get. Um, and then there's the Chromium Embedded Framework. Um, Chromium is the base open source browser that actually Chrome is built <coughs> upon. Um, and the Chromium Embedded Framework is a set of extra, let's call it hooks, for anybody that wants to use the Chromium browser in different unique ways. So if we want to make an app, a desktop application that has a kind of desktop look and feel, i.e. not in your browser, you can get Chromium Better Framework and you can compile your own browser and remove all the stuff from the browser that you don't care about, like the toolbar, the address bar, and all that. Um, and then you get something that looks fairly, fairly decent, just kind of like a window on your desktop. And this is what um, the Node's um, Electron framework uses for doing things like the Atom Editor. That's actually your browser. Um, it's Chromium. Um, so then the other thing to point out is that we have excellent, um, maybe from after this morning's keynote, maybe not so excellent, but um, uh, Python uh, packaging index and uh, uh, packaging distribution. So I want to use that for widgets and and components in general. So that if I you can you can even with this you can think of setting up a some sort of of a marketplace like you just have online for different templates or themes that you can get for your for your widgets. You could just as easily write um, a widget, put it up on PyPI, and anybody can pip install it uh, and just build upon it. And then we have uh, Python application packaging has evolved considerably over the years. Py2exe was uh, had some great contributions, but um, recently I've been fooling around with PyInstaller, and I've been able to get PyInstaller to give me uh, compiled binary executables that can run on OS X and Linux. Haven't gotten to Windows yet because I had to compile some other stuff that takes forever. Uh, but yeah, so so we're getting there, right? Um, and then the thing on top of all of this is that there are cross-platform game engines. Game engines have come a long way from the olden days of monolithic, uh, really expensive, hard to license systems to fairly open, cheap monthly subscriptions, some of them even completely open source to where you can uh, put a game together fairly easily. The, the, and then on top of that, they're very cross-platform like Unity. You can, make a, you can make a game and you can compile or build it, what they call it, for uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, and WebGL, which is also a thing these days. Uh, Unreal is another one that's getting there with uh, cross-platform. Uh, but the Unity community is great. So I wanted to see what I could do with all these things put together. And so let's see how far I got. I uh, made package is called Sophie. Uh, it's the base core of it. I call it a protocol because really that's what I wound up, that was really the core. Um, it's an async I.O. WebSocket server. 
Uh, and then there's like a command and event control system so that you run your Python application, you open a WebSocket server, you automatically direct your computer to open a browser. The browser goes to uh, an HTML page that comes in with the package. The HTML page is pretty much blank. It only has what you need in there to load a job, the JavaScript needed to open a WebSocket client to Python. So then everything else is controlled through Python. Um, then I took Bootstrap, because that's what I used the most and had, was most familiar with. You can just as easily use something else. And I kind of wrapped most of their widgets in Python objects. And I used the uh, Dunder string method to uh, spit out the HTML. So you get a, or yeah, so you get a, you know, an image, you can, you have the, the source, the width, the height, whatever, you can have style, you can have classes, uh, and then if you run string that image object, you'll get the actual HTML code that represents that image. So then you tie that in with the, with the protocol and a little bit of JavaScript that runs on the browser to understand the commands and send the events out through the WebSocket client, and you wind up with a fairly useful, although not totally there, system to uh, change your page using basic DOM elements uh, to whatever HTML you produce through Python and receive events and handle them all in Python. No JavaScript code. Um, so then I, trying to get a little further, I used the Chromium Embedded Framework. I was able to actually produce a kind of looks like a desktop app type system. I'll show you guys in a minute. And I tied it into Unity 3D. So I can actually, I did the exact same thing. Instead of having a JavaScript, it's C-sharp. So Unity uses C-sharp. Uh, it can do JavaScript as well. Uh, but there's a C-sharp WebSocket um, client that already existed for Unity. So I just reused that code. Um, bring that online inside Unity and uh, wrote a C-sharp object. Uh, library to uh, receive the commands and process things. So I can spawn, uh, right now I just have like the very, very basic things. Like I can spawn cubes, spheres, cylinders, capsules, or whatever in 3D space and text and send input back and forth uh, with Python. And again, most of the logic is, is in Python. Though for things like 3D and game engines, I'm sure you're going to have to develop some sort of assets that actually run on the engine itself so that you can get actual performance out of it. So before we go here, um, <clears throat> let's look at things a little bit. So this is, if the demo gods allow me to show you. There we go. Um, so. This is using Bootstrap. Some of you might recognize it, so which means it automatically reconfigures itself a little bit. You get the menu and stuff like that. This is kind of like an image library I was just trying out. Now, what are all these images? This is another li another Python project of mine where I was trying to play with Python's imaging library, um, and I took um, just general files you have lying around and took the binary code and produced uh, an image out of it. So this is this is Flask zipped up. Um, this is a Mac OS uh, app bundle. Um, this is a bzip something. I can't remember what that was. Uh, and this is something else. Uh, I forget. Um, but in general, it's, it's interesting to see all the patterns that kind of emerge here. But whatever. That's a, a side project and a talk for another time. Um, but yeah, so this is all produced through Python, right? Um, like I said, this browser is the Ceph simple version, so I didn't even like do any of my own customizations. If you go to the Chromium Better Framework website, um, you can download and compile Ceph simple, which is has all the browser stuff stripped out, um, and it's Chrome pretty much. You run it and talks to Python. Python tells it what to display. I can even so these are fairly large images, so I didn't do that. Uh, what I'm about to say, but um, so these are just image tags with sources to fi files that are in my file system. But through my Python code, I, I can actually send in data URI images as well. Um, so that can be sent through the WebSocket if needed. Um, 
So this is this example. And I forgot to kick off something else here that I was trying to get in the background going. This is Unity 3D, if anybody's ever seen that before. Um, that's what it looks like. So my original plan for this talk was to give it all in Unity. Um, but it just didn't look all that great. So I figured I'd just start here. So I actually wrote a slide presentation for all of this. So I can, you know, my, my same slides are all here. Um, so you can see I hit my keyboard. Events are coming in. Those are going off to Python. Python saying, oh, I received the key. What do you want to do? It changes the text. What are these cubes? These are tweets. I got TweetPy running in the background. You can see some of the text. And, uh, doesn't help very much. If it's red, it was a retweet. If it's gray, it's just a, a normal tweet. Um, this is plugged in. It's just running hashtag Python. Luckily, Python is a very popular topic, not just because of the language, but because of Monty Python, which is how this whole thing started anyway, and actual Pythons. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so that gives you an example. I wanted to like run this through the whole talk, and so we had like a whole big pile of cubes going in the background. but. Uh, I forgot to start and started, um, but just to show you that this actually does exist and actually is running code. Um, <clears throat> so this is my listener. Um, this is this section of code is where I'm saying, "Hey Unity, I want you to spawn an object for me." Um, you can expand this a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, and so like right now it's doing cubes, so let's change it to do capsules, something like that. Um, go back to here, run it there. It's waiting for the server. Server runs. There we go, and we got capsules instead of cubes, and they roll because physics actually works in here. So, yeah. This is what I've been fiddling with. Um, so the other, the other nice thing about this is I can actually, it's, it's Unity. Unity actually compiles the game. So I can actually build, this is inside the editor, but I can actually build um, a, a thing that'll look just like the, the original app I showed you that was a website um, that looks like an application, like an actual application. Um, and it'll run iOS, Android, whatever I build it for. Um, but yeah, so you guys can keep tweeting and we we'll keep seeing more capsules come up here. But, um, so this is what I got. It's been interesting uh, so far. I think we've been able to get fairly far with it. And my main, my main thing here is what can we do with Python, Python to make sure that we're ready for user interfaces of the future? Uh, more specifically, AR is a big thing. Um, and so is VR. I think for Python, AR will be more useful, especially because we have so much um, image processing available and so many back-end tools uh, for scientific computing to produce better visualizations and all of that. And if I have to go and install, spend hours just trying to install all the back-end tools that are needed to get things working in the first place, why not just produce kind of like my own version of Bootstrap, but it's really Unity 3D game that gives you all the basics that you need to just spawn stuff in 3D space that represents uh, whatever it is that you're working on. So I'm good. Thanks. Um, this was fun thing to put together. Questions? Sure. Yeah, so, so I, will say, I will add to this that um, Python has been used in rendering for years um, for the pipelining. Uh, so if you go look at uh, folks that do big movie studios and all of that, um, they, do, they have all their tools that do like the actual, like if you look at, for example, just to start somewhere, Blender. Blender, uh, the back end in Blender is Python scriptable, right? So you can write scripts to, get, to create 
mesh objects or game objects or whatever that you can then maybe serve up in a little web server and import automatically into a Unity game engine or something like that. Um, but the pipelining for you know, making, making those objects and those models, those 3D models, um, optimizing them, creating the assets that goes and works for all of them, uh, uh, kicking off the rendering, uh, and all of that, Python has been used for years for all that. <laughs> well, I'll say C++ actually for gaming itself, um, yeah, I mean you need low level stuff, but, but Unity and uh, things like Unreal, they have a whole bunch of scripting things on the side. They'll use, so Unity has a Python stuff in it, but it's, it's kind of their own version of Python. And they have uh, uh, JavaScript and C Sharp and um, Unreal is C, but they have like a different scripting language. It goes with it. But, um, yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I keep saying Unity. I keep trying to remember to say Unity 3D. But, uh, yeah, Unity 3D is its own game engine. Uh, if you don't know about it, you should check it out. It's open source. Um, you can make like that thing. It's all free. You can just download it, make your tools, fiddle with it. Um, there might be some things that you want to. Uh, that are more advanced that you'll need, for, uh, you'll need to do. But you can make all kinds of games with it. So, yeah. Anybody else? Why not? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I don't have everything up yet. So, I have a GitHub repo uh, with Sophie, and I don't have the Unity stuff up yet. I, over the next month or so, will probably get an S3 account and put up even my compiled stuff. And um, I'll do a few blog posts to talk about how all this works and, and how to plug into it. Yeah. So I can only talk about my experiences because this is like a religion, just like we were I was talking to somebody earlier about you know Python versus C and indenting and all of that. Um, so uh, Unreal will get you, last I checked, better graphics. Um, but if you're not doing anything completely crazily advanced in that sense, um, Unity's fine. And if you're just starting, Unity's not a bad place to start because there's a very large community for you to get help. Um, and uh, there's a, they have like a, a yearly conference too called Unite. Um, I don't know where it is this year. Uh, I think it's in LA actually. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and so you get, there's a, there's a lot of tools that, can, that you can import things into Unity from. You have the capability of exporting into a lot of things as well. And you can do pretty much everything with it and graphics are, are are fairly advanced today, just probably not at the Unreal or CryEngine level. But there's another one which is Lumberjack, if you guys don't know about Lumberjack, which is Amazon took CryEngine and split it off. And, and yeah, and they made their own thing. It's now called Lumberjack. Uh, and it has a number of uh, optimizations for um, networked gaming, i.e. MMOs and things like that. And I see that one of the big MMO guys just joined Amazon, so maybe Amazon will be making the the dude that worked on on EverQuest is now is now up in in Amazon. So I don't know if Amazon's going to be making games, but hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's fun. It's really really complicated. So like to do something so. I, just to give you guys a bit more idea, just to do something simple, it's not bad. Like you can spawn things, you get the idea, um, understanding kind of the game world is not too bad. But then when you start getting to having like uh, scripted reactions to things and like uh, collisions and the physics and particle physics, that's, that's still okay. The really complicated stuff is all the graphics design behind it and all of the you know, and it's not just uh, video, but it's also the audio that goes with your games to really, really give you an immersive experience. Yeah. Anybody else?
Yeah, yeah, sure. So somebody already took, just you said React, and somebody already took Sophie and forked it and have React running in the background. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as um, the future, I, you know, there's, there's a new JavaScript library, what, every second? Maybe we should have like a running clock till the next JavaScript library. Um, I, I find it easier to reason about it like widgets than some back-end uh, thing that's just automatically watching data to make changes for you and stuff like that, which is what React does. Um, I don't know. I think the current, the current web technologies are just too big for you to kind of like offset that, at least for now. And so for the foreseeable future, you're going to be stuck with most of that. All right. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thanks, everybody.